Indie gaming has forever changed thanks to the Nintendo Switch, putting even the smallest and most obscure games in the hands of a huge and diverse audience. The Switch owners now have hundreds of inexpensive, fantastic indie games at their disposal, and we've become spoiled for choice with all these great selections. But with that huge library also comes an ironic drawback. There are so many indie games that it's difficult to find the one that's right for you. So to make a video that'll get lots of views, to make it easier for you to find the best indie games you've never heard of, I quickly slapped together, put lots of time and research into finding the 15 best hidden indie gems on the Nintendo Switch. These may not be the greatest games ever made, but they're really good and are well worth playing. Flint's Hook is a 2D action platformer where you play a space pirate captain named Flint Hook on a quest to rob and plunder as much as the seven spaces as he can. Developer Tribute Games built Flint Hook around two abilities, a hook shot that lets you swing around levels like some sort of man spider, and the ability to slow time. The game looks gorgeous, with a stylized pixel art look, deep parallax backgrounds, and several obstacles and enemies on screen at once to both look good and to avoid. Featuring bosses, randomized levels, roguelike elements, and a laser gun to commit gruesome murder in the name of theft, Flint Hook takes elements from a lot of popular indie games and applies a level of Polish that makes it stand above the competition. Want to travel around a steampunk world as a valet to a helpless rich idiot, getting embroiled in revolutions, solving murders, and breaking land speed records? Well, if you do, 80 Days is the game for you. It's also the perfect game for anyone seeking top-notch writing, a gritty yet gripping art style, and retellings of classic literature. Based on the Jules Verne book Around the World in 80 Days, this 80 Days follows the basic setup of the book. You, playing as Phileas Fogg's trusted manservant Passpart 2, must travel around the world in 80 days or less thanks to a massive bet fog made with one of his friends. Setting off east, you must travel from city to city, spending as little time as money as possible while also being sure to bring any essential items along the way. There are tons of characters to meet, cities to travel to, and you'll often get mixed up in whatever events or affairs are going on in the places you visit. The possibilities here are endless. It's mind-boggling the amount of interactions you can have and events you can witness in this game. You can put tens of hours into it and only scratch the surface, and its structure of traveling from place to place place lends itself well to playing either a few minutes when you're out and about yourself, or popping it on the TV to play for hours at a time. If you've grown tired of Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing, or wish there was more of a combat focus in those games, then Crashland may be right up your farm. The story takes cues from Pikman in that you play a galactic truck driver who crashes on an alien planet. Your cargo gets stolen by an evil alien, and you have to fight and tame a bunch of other aliens to get your shipment back, but also build a place where you can live in the meantime. Farm, build buildings, go hunting, and make new alien friends as you try and survive a harsh alien landscape. But you'll also get into more scrapes than you'd expect from a typical farming crafting game like this too. That's why combat is more than just whacking an enemy with a stick until it's dead, as you'll need to dodge, block, and level up different moves and abilities to survive. And since you play a delivery driver, you can also make deliveries, or you can find alien eggs and raise them as your own to help you build a fight. There's a lot you can do in Crashlands that you can't do in other games like this, which makes it the perfect game to play in between long sessions of Stardew Valley or any other game, because despite the combat, it still has that laid back, let me just play for a few more minutes quality to it. Looking for a game that combines 2D platforming, Pinball the Postman, and a Studio Ghibli film? Well, that's pretty weird, and you probably weren't anyway, but you should be. In which case, you can stop now, because that's exactly what Yoku's Island Express is. You play Yoku, a dung beetle who's taken upon himself to deliver mail on a tropical island he's just arrived to, only to discover that the island is home to a locked away deity. Deciding to also start delivering justice, Yoku sets out to defeat evil and free the deity by traversing the island, unlocking new power-ups, and defeating bosses, and also rebuild the post office while he's at it, because why not? Yoku's Island Express is a Metroidvania, which is to say you'll be backtracking throughout an open world after receiving new power-ups that'll help you get to new areas. There are multiple characters to talk to, each with their own story to follow, and the pinball platforming that makes this game so unique. It's also one of the few games where you'll be fleeing around a ball of crap everywhere, since you are a dung beetle, after all. Good thing he's only delivering junk mail, I guess.
Cosmic Star Heroine is an old school RPG reminiscent of a Super Nintendo game. It's got chonky pixels, a sci-fi, cyberpunk aesthetic, and plenty of turn-based combat and story as you'd expect from Chrono Trigger, Suikoden 2, or Final Fantasy. You play as Alyssa LaSalle, who was once a secret agent for the Agency of Peace and Intelligence on the planet Arunu. That doesn't sound secretly evil or anything. Oh wait, it does, and they are. So she goes rogue in an effort to stop their evil plans. You'll be forming a party and traveling to three different planets in Cosmic Star Heroin, battling aliens, robots, API agents, exploring long abandoned cities, and even running into ghosts and magic. Developer Z-Boy Games has stated many times that they were inspired by Chrono Trigger and Fantasy Star, and that influence is obvious throughout. There are no random battles, you can see enemies and where battles will take place in the field. Combat is briskly paced too, with a hyper mode meter building up throughout turns, allowing you to deal increased amounts of damage, and style points for doing certain moves that also up your damage output. Even the story isn't too heavy, taking a light tone and poking fun at typical RPG tropes. Chroma Squad is another turn-based RPG, but this one is more inspired by the Power Rangers, as you play a team of actors who grow tired of being yelled at by their director and break off to start their own Super Sentai show. So not only do you go out in the field and control a team of knockoff Power Rangers fighting actors in cardboard boxes and ski masks, you also have to manage the studio itself. There's a lot to do, both in front of and behind the camera. You have to upgrade the studio, buying green screens, paying actors, getting better cameras, and signing marketing deals, all of which can affect your bottom line. The better your show does, the more opportunities are afforded to you, but if your show performs poorly, you have to take more and more dramatic measures to succeed. In combat, things aren't as simple as they first seem. Being a Power Rangers show, teamwork is the key, as you can unlock multiple team-based attacks, but individual combat is just as important. You can use a variety of weapons and armor, all starting out as cheap cardboard props, but upgrading to more serious hardware as more people watch the show. And yes, there are mecha fights too. And yes, they are awesome. This is one of my favorite indie games ever, and I cannot recommend it enough. In fact, I already made a video review of it. If you want to go check that out, you, you probably don't. I don't blame you. I love 3D platformers, so at least one was going to make it onto this list. That would be Unbox Newbie's Adventure. There have been a rash of indie 3D platformers in the last few years, but most of them do little more than emulate older games in the genre. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just I've craved something a little more original, and that's exactly what Unbox delivers. Rather than a standard jump, you instead unbox. You play as a cardboard box, but really he's a Russian nesting doll, with a box inside a layer of six other boxes like the layers of an onion. You can do a tiny little hop, but to really gain height, you need to unbox. That is, eject the outermost box from your set of layers, which will propel you up into the air. This set of boxes that encapsulate you act as both a finite number of jumps and your health bar, so you have to be smart with when you jump and how far you plan on going. The game is also momentum based. Since you play a cardboard box without arms or legs, you have to roll around everywhere, meaning you can gain a good bit of speed going downhill, but struggle going upstairs. You can also chain unboxings together to keep going higher and further, meaning you can clear long gaps in the blink of an eye. Again, I absolutely adore this game, and it's one I've already covered on this channel before if you want to go check out a more in-depth review of it. But suffice to say, this is a great 3D platformer that fits right at home on the Switch, and is perfect once you finish Super Mario Odyssey, A Hat in Time, or New Super Lucky's Tale. The Low Road is an adventure game not too dissimilar from Ginny LeClue or Broken Age. You play a freshly graduated paper pusher in a 1970s intelligence agency who must work their way up the chain to become a genuine secret agent. And like Cosmic Star Heroin, you soon discover your agency isn't the good guy after all. That's not a spoiler, don't worry. The game plays like a typical point-and-click adventure game from the modern era. You can move freely around, but also point-and-click on objects to examine them and add them to your inventory for later. You can talk to NPCs and make dialogue options, and there are puzzles aplenty. It wouldn't be an adventure game without those, right? Playing a spy, you not only have to solve puzzles, but also perform some dialogue gymnastics as you talk to characters and use your wits and deduction to find out what you're looking for, whether or not they're lying to you. Think of this as a detective game, where you have to not only solve puzzles, but also piece together a larger mystery, figuring out what you need to do, who to talk to, and ultimately discover that it was Old Man Jenkins merely disguised as a ghost yet again. 
If you're looking for another fast-paced, twitchy 2D platformer similar to Super Meat Boy, Slime Son might be the game for you. As the titular Slime Son, you must jump, bounce, and I guess slime yourself across increasingly difficult obstacles as you try and escape the belly of a giant worm that ate you. You're constantly being chased by a wall of acid on each level, so you have to quickly rush through levels using a combination of bouncing, slime powers that let you climb walls, a morphing ability which can briefly let you float, or dissolve yourself to fit through cracks and tight obstacles. The eShop page boasts 100 levels made up of 400 rooms, plus a new game plus mode with another 100 more levels. There's a town of survivors where you can talk to NPCs and buy items, local multiplayer, mini games, unlockable outfits, and speedrun and boss rush modes. My favorite indie game of all time recently made it to the Nintendo Switch, and I couldn't be happier. That game is The Sexy Brutale, and calling it sexy sells the game short. This is a narrative adventure, explorative mystery game set in a casino and hotel where you've been invited to a masked costume party by a mysterious benefactor. But not all is as it seems, as the waitstaff start murdering their guests. Your job is to not solve these murders, but to stop them from happening, and you do so with a pocket watch that lets you travel back in time a short distance. The catch is, you can't be seen, otherwise there's all kinds of wibbly wobbly time stuff that'll just destroy everything, so you have to hide, watch these murders take place, then retroactively figure out how to stop them without being seen by interfering either with the murderer or the victim, moving objects around, interrupting their routine, or just generally causing problems for everyone involved. You can go back in time as much as you want per level, so it's very much like Groundhog Day in that regard. And I don't want to spoil it, but the story is fantastic, and this is one of the few times where a twist ending not only works, but it's cemented my love for the game. Really though, I love everything about the sexy brutale. The presentation in particular is fabulous, with fantastic art and music. If you get this game, you owe it to yourself to play it on a TV because it's just so gorgeous. Even if you can't, get it anyway, because the sexy brutale is one of the best games games I've ever played, indie or otherwise. Who doesn't like sports? quite a lot of people as a matter of fact, but that doesn't mean those same people can't like a good goofy strategy sports game, and that's exactly what Gunbare Super Strikers is. It's a mix of tactical turn-based RPG and soccer, or football, or football, or leg orange, whatever you want to call it. You control all your players on one team in an effort to score, and stop the other team from scoring. Duh. To do this though, you have a variety of crazy moves like racing the ground in front of your goal, a tornado kick that'll not only move the ball, but also clear the opposing team out of the way, or the ability to turn invisible. If you're familiar with Cyanide Studios Blood Bowl 2, it works the same way, though this is a much more family-friendly presentation. If you're not, then it's basically any turn-based RPG but with a soccer ball instead of swords or guns, and you can't kill anybody. There's a single-player campaign mode featuring a small-town team trying to make it to the big leagues, but there's also local multiplayer, standalone matches, and tournament play. There's no online multiplayer, which I can see being a turn-off for some, but if you're looking for a good arcade sports game that isn't a super serious simulator or a turn-based RPG that does things a little differently, then maybe give however you pronounce this game, which is a Japanese word meaning to ask someone to give their best, a try. Speaking of games that do things a little differently, our next game is Ironcast, a turn-based strategy meets match 3 puzzle game. Set in alternate history steampunk Victorian London, it's always Victorian London with these, isn't it? You and your team must take control of a group of mechs and defend England against an invading force of people who aren't you. Battles play out in match 3 form, where you have to form combos in order to gather resources, play defense, and land hits against your foes. In between battles, you also get an XCOM-like interface where you can upgrade raid mechs, recruit more soldiers, and decide what battles you want to go into next. Also like XCOM, Ironcast features roguelike elements, such as permadeath for soldiers and randomly generated levels. The Switch version features touchscreen controls and HD rumble, if that's your kind of thing, as well as two campaigns and up to 50 different items to unlock and find. This is a dense game, and like Super Strikers, it's perfect for anyone who's a fan of one of this game's genres, or anyone looking for something new. At the very least, it's a new puzzle game that you can play when you're out on the go, or go going on the toilet, as is often the case.
Perhaps the most obscure game in today's video is Of Mice and Sand Revised, which is a strategy management game in the same vein as This War of Mine or Fallout Shelter, where you have to manage a group of survivors, mice in this case, on a ship stranded on an alien planet. Originally created for the 3DS, Of Mice and Sand is perfect on the Switch because it was built with a touchscreen and mobility in mind. You have to give orders to your mice to eat, sleep, build new sections of the ship, repair old sections, craft new items, sell items, and scavenge for supplies using a touch interface, and it works really well. Along the way, you run into monsters, aliens, ruined cities, you climb mountains and cross deserts, and also there's rainbow poop. So there you go. This revised version on the Switch brings multiple enhancements, including updated graphics, new maps, events, enemies, and quests. This is a game full of micromanagement, so if you're not into having to tell your mice to do every little thing, this might not be the game for you. But if you take pride in whipping your band of idiots into shape and building the biggest, most beautiful ship imaginable, then of Mice and Sand revised could be right up your mouse-infested alley. Phoenix Wright isn't exactly a series that's in danger of ending anytime soon, but if you've played all those games already, and Professor Layton too, then Avery Attorney should be your next game. It wasn't inspired by Capcom's long-running franchise so much as it's a fan game, but it also came out when Hatiful Boyfriend was all the rage, so it's also got birds in it. Welcome to indie games. Enjoy your stay. Just like in Phoenix Wright, you play a lawyer who doubles as a private eye for some reason, and just like Phoenix Wright, you have to defend your clients in melodramatic courtroom scenes. And just like Phoenix Wright, you're a young prosecutor looking to make a name for yourself, going up against a cocky star lawyer. There are some differences though, namely in the setting. Here it's 1848 Paris on the heels of yet another French Revolution, and you play a young crow attorney trying to make a name for yourself. You're given a case by an aristocratic cat, an aristocat if you will, and from there things spiral further and further out of control, both in your life and in life in Paris, culminating in events that are far bigger than yourself as the fate of the city rests on your wings. Also unlike a city in Arizona going a certain direction that is the opposite of left, you can fail cases in this game, and the story will continue on. You won't get a game over and be forced to start again. I'd tell you more, but this is such a narrative heavy game, I'd start encroaching into spoiler territory, so I'll end by saying that this game is far from foul. Our final game of the day is another older game that's recently been ported over to the Switch, and that's Opus The Day We Found Earth. It's also another game that's difficult to pin down a genre for. Part visual novel, part point and click, part space exploration, Opus incorporates various elements from several genres to give the game a somewhat unique feel, while still feeling familiar. You play a scientist astronaut tens of millions of years into the future who's tasked with tracking down the long forgotten home of humanity. Earth. Your robot pal Emeth promised somebody centuries ago they'd find the pale blue planet to save humanity, so together you use a giant telescope to try and pin down the location of this weird little planet in the middle of nowhere. It's got pretty simple gameplay. You accept a mission that'll task you with finding a star, you scan the area it's believed to be in with your telescope, and you keep searching based on clues until you find it, at which point you'll also find a bunch of planets which your scanner will tell you is how similar it is to Earth. As you complete missions, you'll get closer and closer to your goal and unlock new areas on your ship. This was originally a mobile game too, so again, it's perfect for touchscreen and mobile gaming. It even won awards as a mobile game. What hasn't won any awards is this channel, because I chase popular content like this video. But if you want to give me your own award, you can do so by liking this video and subscribing if you haven't already. That makes no sense, which further explains why I'll never win anything. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time!